Let's open our Bibles this morning. Let's see, uh, where are we going to be first? We're going to be back in the subject of law, grace, the grace, the amazing grace of God. Before we begin this morning, let's bow in prayer and commit our time to the Lord. Father God, we thank You for this morning that we can assemble as the body of Christ. And Father, I pray that by Your doing, that all of Your purposes for why we assemble will be accomplished, that we will be encouraged and edified. This morning we will be equipped Uh, Father, and in our fellowship one to another, uh, we would be being an encouragement to each other and building one another up. Uh, Father, by the power of Your Spirit and through Your living Word, uh, Father, encourage us in this important subject of understanding uh, Your grace and understanding, uh, Father, that You have given us every provision Uh, to live by grace. We are saved by grace and we will grow by grace and by grace we will be glorified one day uh, to be with You forever. So Father, encourage our hearts with uh, this subject of grace. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, last week we... uh, Two weeks ago I started to talk about a law in relationship to grace. Uh, Law is often in contrast uh, to grace. There is, um, let me back that up, there is the understanding, a biblical understanding of law will help us to understand grace uh, a little more enhance our understanding of God's grace as we talk and understand and learn about the law. And what does the law mean? Well, the law has different nuances to it. We're going to be talking about it most specifically in relationship to the grace of God. And three verses that will set us up to this in Romans 4. Uh, For now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. And in this uh, sense here, we will associate law with works. Uh, One nuance, uh, one facet of law. Uh, Well, man takes God's law and he uses it in a way that God never intended for it to be used. Man uses it as a way of either trying to gain God's righteousness or man uses law as a means of acceptance before God, even in the Christian way of life. And that's where I want to look at law in the context of the Christian way of life. Um, All of us, probably almost everyone here, understands and believes that We're not saved by keeping the law. We're not saved by anything we can contribute for our salvation. We are saved by God's grace fully. God did everything for us that we might have uh, His perfect righteousness. And He did everything through His Son, Jesus Christ, that we might have forgiveness of our sins and eternal life. So no one probably, I mean the world has a problem with thinking they can earn their way to be accepted by God and to be saved. But as believers, we really shouldn't have a problem with understanding that at all. And so I'm skipping right over that and going to the Christian way of life. This is where Christians have a problem. 
We think we have to earn our way through the Christian way of life. We think we have to earn our acceptance before God by doing, 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 by working, working, working. When actually, from myself, nothing good can come from myself. My only merit for salvation, my own, excuse me, my only uh, merit in the Christian way of life is Jesus Christ. Christ has provided everything I need and everything you need to live the Christian way of life that God intends us to live. And so there is where the, the conflict comes in. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace. It is of faith, and that is juxtaposed to works. It's, it's of faith that it might be according to grace. If it's, if it's of works, it's not according to God's grace. It means we are earning our way or we are making our way on our own versus God's grace enabling us to live the life He wants us to live. And the last one, Romans 11.6, And if by grace, then it is no longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. But if it is of works, it is no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. Now, law by God's design, has its place. And there has been law right from the beginning, and there will be, in a sense, law. We have God's commands today that we are living by as um, a standard, His standard of righteousness. And we are to stay in the boundaries of His standard of righteousness. So in that sense, uh, we still have Law, not the Mosaic law. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about law with a uh, a little l, lowercase l. By God's design, great uh, law has its place. But since Christ came, died, and rose again, grace should be our rule of life. Romans 6:14, which we'll look at a little bit later. Grace should be our rule of life. That's our standard by which we live. Or that is our provision through Christ by which we are able to live a life, a, a supernatural life. I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what's frustrating. Try to live the supernatural way of life in and of yourself. That's frustrating because it's impossible but we bang our heads against the wall and we try to do it. When God has made every provision through Jesus Christ, every grace provision through Jesus Christ, that we would be free from the law as it were, and we would be under, place ourselves under grace. Grace should be our rule of life rather than law, works, merit. We're going to briefly look at law through time, but I want to first understand that we have a natural tendency in the man, the man in our nature, we have a natural tendency to take law and attempt to use it in the wrong way. Attempt to gain merit with God by being good, by doing right. And we, we think sometimes if we read our Bible in the morning and we, we have a prayer time, then boy, we feel good. And it's good to do that. We, sh we all should do that. Pray and read God's Word, but not to gain merit, not to gain credit, not to in and of ourselves try and muster uh, this as a work. Um, and that's what law is man's effort. Law is man's works to please God or earn His way or to further progress myself in spiritual growth and spirituality. 
when actually I should be looking at grace. All that Christ has provided for me and all of, all of those provisions, and Christ should be my full merit, my full um, focus in the Christian way of life, not myself. Even Jesus told the Apostle Paul, when Apostle Paul prayed three times, would you please take this thorn in my flesh so I can be a better minister, so I can be more productive, so I can, and so on and so forth. And Jesus' reply to him was, my grace is sufficient for you. What, gra- what was he talking about? Jesus was saying, the Christian way of life and your ministry, Paul, is all by my grace, not by your works. You can just live with that thorn in your flesh, You can just live with whatever. You just keep your eyes on Me and focus on Me. My grace is sufficient for you to minister and to grow spiritually. And But we have a problem because we tend tend to feel like we can do better if this wasn't the case or that wasn't the case. When really... What do we have? Where do we have our eyes? We have our focus on ourselves. And if we were fully looking at grace, God's grace provision through Jesus Christ, and a lot of those provisions you'll find in Romans chapter 6, the identification with Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. And then when you get down to verse 14, you'll see that Paul writes that we are no longer under law, but we are under grace. Therefore, sin should not have dominion over us. So, law is, if I were going to make it simple, law works is trusting in myself to live the Christian way of life, to serve, to minister. I'm trusting in myself. I can do this. I can do this. The focus is myself, it's my strength. It's my ideas. It's my wisdom. Grace is when I'm trusting in Jesus Christ, period. His grace is sufficient for me in the Christian way of life. Turn with me, if you would, to Galatians chapter 3. Verses 2 and 3, very familiar to us, but good to remember. Galatians chapter 3, we'll start in verse 1, Paul writes, O O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit... Are you now being made perfect by the flesh? This is exactly, this is an age old problem that's been around since man has been around. That we understand that we begun, we have begun in the Spirit. We have, we were saved by the grace of God regenerated through the power of the Spirit as it it talks about the washing of regeneration in uh, Titus chapter 3, verse 5, I believe it is. But then after God did everything for our salvation and we understand that, then what do we do? Are you now being made perfect by your own flesh? 
your own strength. By you, you're doing it now. Made perfect doesn't mean uh, made perfect means to be mature. The word actually means uh, to be full, but the idea is of growing to maturity. Are you now in the Christian way of life going to do this on your own? Really? Who has bewitched you? Because Paul is trying to protect them. He's trying to protect them from the bondage Christians place themselves under when they try to live the Christian way of life by their own flesh. I can do this. I can gut this out. Rather than falling on the mercy of God and looking to Christ alone for every provision to live every day in the Christian life like God wants us to. And I, I'm sure we all catch ourselves. I catch myself every day thinking, you idiot. You're, ju- you're thinking works. Even when I'm praying, I'll confess a sin and the next thing I know, I'm confessing it again. And then again. I go, what are you thinking? I'm trying to, it's like it's up, unconsciously I'm trying to gain merit with God for forgiveness of my sins. That's foolishness. But it crops up in our hearts. It crops up in our hearts. This works orientation instead of fully relying on the grace of God. And if you become aware of this, you'll start to see it in your thinking. Paul wrote an entire book on it, and more beyond that, because it was such a problem with Christians. What happens is, really the damage is this is that when I place myself under the bondage of my performance, what happens when I fail? And then I fail. And then I fail. What happens then? I spoke with a man once, probably about two years ago, A man as old as I. And he doubted he was even saved anymore. He doubted he was ever saved. Because he started looking at himself and his performance. And he got discouraged and he was totally in bondage to law works. And he had Full, he had dropped the grace of God in his life. On a, really, not consciously, but unconsciously. And so, guard yourselves in this. Now, let's take a quick run through. Uh, just, I just want to emphasize, law is good. Law has a place. It's just that we use God's law wrongly in a wrong manner law originated from god his standards are holy and righteous just as he is and was there law before the mosaic law the answer is yes we don't have to we don't have to go too far in the beginning of genesis we get to chapter 2 and it says that god placed adam in the garden of eden and then god commanded Adam, not to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God commanded Adam, don't eat of that tree. Of all the other trees you may freely eat, but do not eat of that tree. In the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. What did he do? (laughs) He ate of that tree. And sin 
and death have passed on to all men because all sinned, as it says in Romans 5.12. And thus the necessity of God's grace because mankind, we find ourselves in a position that we cannot work our way out of. There is no amount of works, no amount of works is going to take away one of your sins. Not one. You can't take away your sin. As a matter of fact, we keep producing more every day, don't we? So let's take a look at, well, I forgot to put this up. In the Christian way of life, law and grace often clash. Now, law, I quoted, uh, just talked about Genesis 2.15. Under, right in the very beginning with Adam, there was uh, a commandment, commandments by God. Uh, when we get to Genesis 4, we learn that there was... Um, a, a right way uh, to offer sacrifice, and there was a wrong way. And God, in chapter 4, God was talking to Cain and saying, sin is crouching at the door. There was uh, probably a, um, already a law that uh, they were not to take one another's life. There was, uh, again, the sacrificial laws, and there were probably a lot more laws than we are aware of or that are recorded. Then when you get to Moses, Exodus 20 through 31, about 2,500 years later, uh, God gave Moses what is now called the Mosaic Law. Chapters 20 through 31, you can read all of that, and, and there were many, many laws. And Deuteronomy and reiteration of the blessings and cursings for the or following or obeying the commandments or disobeying the commandments of God. And then when we get to uh, Romans uh, 6, 13, we find, let me um, just read it. And do not present your members as instruments of righteousness, instruments of unrighteousness. No, that's not the verse I want. Um, oh, then... 14, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. And then when we get to the kingdom period, Jesus Christ will rule with a rod of iron. There'll be law in the kingdom period. So there's always been law. Law is not bad. Law is necessary. But it's how we use law, especially um, as believers in the Christian a way of life, we miss we misuse law. Today, divine favor or grace is not earned, otherwise it's not grace. We have been given everything by grace for our salvation. We are given everything for our progressing sanctification, i.e. spiritual growth. And we will be given grace for our eternal glorification. We cannot earn any of that. But we try awfully hard to, especially in the sanctification process. Our life as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ ought not to be a treadmill of works to gain merit or favor from God. Our only merit is in Jesus Christ. That's the only thing that God is pleased with is His Son, Jesus Christ. And when we're in Christ and we realize our only merit before God is Jesus Christ, then that helps us to get out from under the bondage that we normally try to place ourselves under. And think of it. What are my works? laid down alongside the works of Jesus Christ. That's a pretty pathetic thought, isn't it? I lay all my good down by the cross, and let's see what the comparison looks like. 
And yet, that's how we try to live. My works cannot possibly generate any merit before God for redemption, for sanctification, for spiritual growth, because without Jesus Christ or apart from Christ, I am broken, fleshly, bankrupt. I have nothing to offer in and of myself. Nothing but debt I give to God. When we can clearly see ourselves in this broken condition, then we can begin to understand the grace of God. You know why the grace of God is so difficult to understand? Because we're so stinking full of ourselves. And we can't see the grace of God. Or we resist the grace of God. Because we're proud and arrogant under a humble cloak. Any work that I can do, any work I do to gain God's favor, that work is of me, not of Christ. That work is according to law, works, merit, and not according to grace. But when I look to Jesus Christ, in Him I have all the grace of God poured out on me without any merit or effort of my own. And by the way, when we think of grace, this is what we ought to think of. Because of God's grace to me, I am able to serve the Lord and I desire to do so. That's what we ought to think of when we think of grace. I am able to serve God by His grace and I want to. The law was the rule of life until Jesus Christ ushered in His grace. Today, grace is to be our rule of life. We must think of ourselves under grace rather than under law. Turn with me to Romans 6. I read it once, but I'd like all of you to see it in your own Bibles. I'd like to start reading in verse 11. Paul comes to a conclusion after the first ten verses. Not This isn't the first conclusion he came to, but this is kind of the major conclusion he comes to after the first ten verses. In the first ten verses, Paul is telling these people that they, because of Jesus Christ, and because of their faith in Jesus Christ, they ought to be living their lives in identification with Jesus Christ. Specifically, in His death, that He died to sin, and you too ought to be dead to sin and alive to God. Number two, that He rose from the dead. And as He rose from the dead, He rose to live in newness of life. And we have that provision to live in newness of life, not in the deadness under the law and being dead to God and alive to sin. We have that grace provision and then he tells them uh, among other things that their old man was crucified with Jesus Christ on the cross so that the body of sin might be done away with that we would no longer verse 7 that we would be we are he who has died has been freed from sin do you experience that in your life Are you identifying with Jesus Christ? Are you embracing the grace that God has given you in your salvation, in your position in Jesus Christ? 
And he goes on, I have to read nine, I love nine, and knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. Christ dies no more. And we too should die no more in the Christian way of life. We have every provision to walk in newness of life all the time. The only failure is ours. It's not a failure on God's grace provision for us. And then 11. Likewise, just like the death that he died in verse 10, he died to sin once for all, and the life that he lives, he lives to God, referring to Jesus Christ. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lust and do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and, me and your members as instruments of righteousness to God for because sin shall not have dominion over you for you are not under law but under grace. Now, if, if we're honest with each other and, you, and you're really reading verses 11, 12, and 13, you would say, yeah, wow. That's, what God, that's how God wants me to live. But boy, is it difficult. The difficulty comes again when I try to any degree to live this, when I try to live 11, 12, and 13 to any degree in and of myself, it becomes very difficult. Impossible. Frustrating. And all the while, I'm duking it out and working and working and hard, and working hard and trying and trying and trying. What I have cast away is the grace of God. Hmm. The very liberty He has given me to be able to live verses 11, 12, and 13. How foolish are we sometimes? Very. And so, we face this conflict. You know, it's only by faith that we live our lives under grace rather than law. Turn with me to Romans 8. Please. Let's read down through four verses. This is, we see the grace of God at work here, doing something that we couldn't do, but we try to do it. Starting in verse 1, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, on account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, 
who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. We see in verse 2 that the law of the Spirit of life in Christ, there is the key, in Christ I have been made free from the law of sin and death. I'm no longer under the law. I'm no longer under the bondage of the law. I have by grace that is in Jesus Christ, I have been set free. Because the law could not do, could not provide a righteousness. The law could not do that. But God, sending His own Son, Jesus Christ, in the likeness of sinful flesh, on account of sin, He condemned sin in the flesh with a purpose. So that you and I, so that for you and I, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Might be fulfilled as in the passive voice. We, by the grace of God, which comes through faith in Jesus Christ, the righteous requirement of the law is fulfilled in us when we walk according to the Spirit. When we walk according to our flesh, we cannot fulfill the righteous requirement of the law. We see it has to be by grace, through the Holy Spirit, it cannot be in and of ourselves. All our efforts of our flesh can never, never fulfill God's righteousness. It has to be by the grace of God through Christ's completed work on the cross. Law keeping was never intended as the way to perfect righteousness, justification. Although, time and time again, we attempt, in one sense, to do that. So law directs me to my only hope. The law puts me up against a wall saying, you cannot do this by law, by works. And it leads me to my only hope, Jesus Christ, who is the grace of God. Well, we could go farther, but uh, I think we'll make sure we leave enough time for communion. We'll pick this up in, t we'll be away for two weeks, so in, in three weeks we'll pick this up. Let's pray. Uh, Father, we are humbled before you as we examine our hearts and realize that every time we have a works orientation in our mind that we are casting off Your grace every time. And so, Father, I ask that You would make us aware of our motives, of the reasoning behind why we do what we do. Help us to properly evaluate our relationship with You and our thoughts in regard to our relationship with You, Father, and uncover in our thinking any thoughts of a works orientation rather than grace. And free us, Father, in our hearts, in our lives, in our minds. Free us, Father, from the bondage we place ourselves under in this works orientation. 
And Father, we thank you for all the provisions that we have in Jesus Christ. May we walk in them. In Jesus' name, amen.